Hello everyone, welcome to the 2017 Open House. Uh, first of all, congratulations on the match. You're part Yay. of the program. Uh, I'm Carl Ligler, I'm the program director for the Family Medicine program until June 30th of 2017. Um, after that, so your program director will be uh, Dr. Stuart Murdoch. Um, he's not here uh, today. Uh, but he certainly will be uh, welcoming you uh, once you start the residency program. Uh, and I'm Vanessa Rambahar. I'm the Associate Program Director for Admissions, Awards and Recruitment. Um, and I, I recognize some of the faces. So welcome to the program. I look forward to seeing you lots over the next couple of months. So we're going to get started. So again, just to, uh, the, the purpose of, uh, of the Open House is to give you an opportunity to meet with with, with the uh, residents and uh, program directors of, of the various sites. Um, this um, open house is geared to the GTA uh, stream, both for Canadian medical graduates and international medical graduates, as well as the rural residency program, uh, where eight of you have matched. Um, and that is because uh, in the RRP program, your first year is spent at either uh, North York General Hospital or the uh, Toronto East Health Network. Um, I'll also mention that there are three public health, pub uh, public health and preventive medicine residents in the program, and you also will be in the GTA stream. Uh, so just the last thing to mention is that this is being recorded, uh, so any questions that you have, we'll repeat them towards the end, and this will be sent out to anyone who was not able to attend today. So you can reassure all your friends and colleagues and, and other um, that weren't able to come today that they, can't, they will access this, and if you want to watch it again, uh, you can watch it again when we send it out. <clears throat> So the goal of the Family Medicine Program at the University of Toronto is to prepare future family physicians for comprehensive primary care anywhere in the province, the country, or the world. We also endeavor to develop academic leaders in education and research. So what is the timeline? So you've survived the match, which is the big, big challenge that you had to survive. Um, and you got here today, which is, which is excellent. Uh, so from now on, what happens is today you'll have a chance to meet with the various site directors and administrators and a resident at, at uh, the booths in the Stone Lobby. Uh, and after that, shortly after, so either the, later this weekend, you'll get an email uh, with a link to the internal match survey. That survey, the big deadline you need to know, will be due on March 19th. So that's a Sunday evening uh, at 8 p.m. The survey is, is such that you can go back to it and change your answers up until the deadline until you press the submit button. So you don't need to press submit until uh, 8 p.m. on March 19th. Uh, and don't worry, I will email you if I don't have your response uh, to make sure that you submit it uh, on time. Uh, after that, we will uh, release the results of the internal match around mid-April, so I highly recommend that if you're looking for a place to live and you're sort of plan trying to plan out where in the city, to wait until around April when you've heard from us. We do try to get the results out as soon as possible, uh, so as soon as we have them, as soon as it's settled with all the hospitals, uh, we will let you know. Uh, finally, afterwards, you will have an orientation at your site and you'll receive lots of documentation from post-grad medical education at U of T. And that is all of your information about immunizations and all of the other sort of documents that you have to put together uh, and submit before your July 1st start date. Uh, for the international medical graduates, it's a little bit different because there are two cohorts just based on hospital availability. Uh, and you will get separate emails and, and lots of communication about when your deadlines are. So just to reiterate, don't buy a house before middle of April. <laughs> um, so how does the, uh, how does the uh, internal match work? It's based on multiple factors, uh, including the capacity of, of each site. So each site has a certain uh, capacity for residents. Um, and as well as the preferences, your preferences, so preferences of incoming residents. We will ask you for your stream to rank all the sites. Don't just rank one or two, unless you only have one or two choices. Um, and if you want, and we would encourage this, please provide us with a brief explanation for your choices. Because what we, what we generally do, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, is we try and match you to your number one choice. But if we cannot, we try and look at your reasoning for choosing those, the sites the way you did and try and match it to a site that will meet your educational needs. 
And I'll reiterate, you're not going to have a choice whether you can rank all available sites. You'd have to <laughs> rank all of them. All right, so a couple of true-falses that we often have questions about uh, is that attendance at the, that this open house and the virtual information session, so Barry Newmarket was yesterday and the rural is on Monday, it does not have an impact on your site assignment. So for those listening in uh, and for those of you here, it's not going to make an impact who you meet, who you talk to, on whether you get into that site or not. So nobody is at a disadvantage. Uh, the strength of your CARMS application, so the rank that where you were on our rank list, does not have an impact on your site assignment either. So it, it has nothing to do with whether you were a good candidate or a bad can, a not so good candidate. <laughs> <laughs> if you get to your, if you don't get to your top site, you are we, all great candidates. Yeah, we have no bad candidates here. <laughs> um, Finally, the timing of the internal match survey submission. So if you get it in at right at 7.59 p.m. versus if you submit it as soon as I email you, it uh, won't also have an impact on your match. So really you have that full next couple of weeks to think about it, change your, your assignments, but make sure when you do press the submit button, you are submitting your final decision. Now, if you don't submit, that will impact your assignment. Yes. So um, as far as the Greater Toronto Area, we just want to give you a, a, a brief, um, uh, I guess, uh, description of, of the sites and how many residents we're, we're talking about here. So in the Greater Toronto Area Stream, there are 114 Canadian medical graduates, uh, three public health residents, and 20 internationally trained residents. Um, and the GTA Stream is composed of 12 hospital teaching sites, uh, two in Mississauga, Scarborough, uh, Markham, um, and uh, North York, and then there are, uh, the remainder would be uh, in, in Toronto. Uh, and in a rural stream, there are eight uh, CMG residents, and there are two GTA teaching hospital sites for the PG-1 one year. As I've said, that's North York General uh, and the Toronto East Health Network. Um, and once you're assigned to one of those sites, then each site is connected with two rural communities. So Toronto East uh, Health Network is connected with um, Port Perry and uh, Orangeville, and North York General is connected with Midland and Aurelia. Oh, well, we already did this. So the, the, to reiterate for any of you who are applying to rural, uh, the virtual information session for you is on Monday, so it's really important. That's a really helpful session to participate in. Uh, because you'll actually meet with uh, Dr. Galiski as well as likely residents from each of the different sites. When it comes to ranking your sites, you will actually rank the uh, rural site, so your second year site, uh, and it corresponds to the first year site as, as listed on this slide. This is just a brief overview for anyone listening in. The Barry or New Market stream, you are either matched to the Barry program or the New Market stream. Uh, and that is for the IMGs as well as the CMGs. And as you see on the slide, there are 14 Canadian graduates and four internationally trained gra graduates. And basically, it's evenly, evenly split seven and seven and two and two to bury a new market. So as far as training in this program for GTA and, in fact, for Barry New Market and Rural, uh, there are this, we have the same learning outcomes. So what, what you're going to be... Your, your learning outcomes are going to be the same irrespective of where you train, um, and it's based on our competency-based curriculum. There may be some differences in the delivery of the curriculum or learning experiences. So you may have, uh, you know, maybe more of certain uh, experiences or rotations. Uh, you may have some rotations that are a little bit different at some sites, but ultimately the competencies that are expected to be delivered and achieved are the same. The core academic program uh, is... Um, uh, not identical. There is a core academic, there are core academic topics that all sites have to address and then uh, the sites determine what other topics need to be addressed based on your feedback or based on uh, certain characteristics of that site. So they may want to supplement or complement their curriculum uh, with some academic day topics that may not be presented at other sites. Uh, the methods of assessment are all the same um, and I think we're going to, are we talking about, I can't remember now. Yeah. So we're going to talk about those. Um, and then the requirements as far as academic projects, including quality improvement, um, and the uh, second year academic project are the same. 
All right, so I'm just going to very briefly go over some of the highlights of the program. Most of you already heard this when you came to your inf interview and information session. Uh, some of the IMGs may not be as familiar with this, but it's all on our website also. Uh, key aspects of feedback and assessment that are done across the program are the FM map. So that's a progress test that's done twice a year for you to self-assess how you're doing in the program. And that focuses on questions in various areas that will eventually, um, you'll need to know for your exam and for, for clinical practice. Uh, and that's administered at each of the different sites. Uh, the practice profile is another way where you can track your own progress and that allows you to track all the encounters that you've had in family medicine. So when you've seen a patient, you log the encounter at the age, the demographics, and then at the six month meeting with your program director that happens at every site, you can look through your practice profile in a graph format and see, oh, I, I've been seeing a lot of pediatric patients, but not enough geriatric. And then you can target your electives and your, the rest of your training towards that. Uh, and finally, Field Notes is a way for preceptors and people that you work with to give you an evaluation on the CANMADS roles and your, uh, your demonstration of them, either in clinical practice or even in the scholarship role. Uh, you can talk about research. Sure. So the research component, component or academic project components composed of two things. One is the quality improvement project uh, in your PGY1 year, um, and you get essentially the same curriculum for that, um, and then you you complete the project at your site. The topics for the projects are varied. Uh, at some sites, there is a focus in terms of quality improvement, so you might be directed to in, uh, to certain projects. Other sites, it's, it's um, uh, more open in terms of uh, uh, topic choice. The resident academic project, which is completed by uh, the end of second year, uh, can be research, can be continuation of your, of your QI activity in first year, could be educational scholarship, or could be some other form um, of academics. And essentially what happens there is once you come up with a topic area or a project idea, you discuss it with your site director as well as your uh, research uh, coordinator at the site to make sure it's of, the, uh, of sufficient scope to qualify as an academic project. All right, so this is what you are all sort of wondering about is the internal match. Uh, so this is mainly data for the Canadian medical graduates. Uh, I'll preface that by, by saying that. Um, the key aspect is that you will likely be matched to one of your top four ranked sites. So I do say that and I'm, I highlighted it in bold for you uh, so that you make sure that any of the, the top four sites that you rank are sites that you would be happy doing your residency at because you have a very, very high chance, as you see, most people get their actually top three choices, but you have a very high chance of getting your top four, one of your top four choices. So do not put something in your top four that you would not be happy at. So don't put a site that you would not be happy at in your top four. So just to, just to add to that, maybe I'll, I'll do it now. Um, so we, sometimes we have residents who, um, uh, who try and sort of figure out um, the match. And, and uh, I know, and so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and so what they try and do is they try and figure out what the most popular sites are and use them in the match to sort of create, you know, try and force us to, to put them at their number one site. It doesn't work well. Uh, and sometimes you'll get a, a lot of residents will end up at their second site um, and they'll be really, really unhappy. They would much rather be at a different site, even not their top one. Um, so what I have to say about that is, as Vanessa has pointed out, um, rank them the way you want it to go. Okay? If you play a game with us, you're likely to lose. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want that. Um, and then finally I'll say as part of my role I also do the awards. Um, which happens around this time of year. Um, and it's so reassuring because I actually, I know who gets their, their top site, who gets their fourth choice, and some of the IMGs sometimes get lower than that just by virtue of the, the space allocation. Uh, and I actually have seen so many people who are not at their top choice of site nominating preceptors or preceptors nominating residents, um, which is really nice because it just shows how great an, an experience they've had even at a site that wasn't their top choice. Uh, so we always say that 
at the end of the year when we when when Dr. Igler meets with the the residents at their site, almost everyone who didn't receive their top choice would have picked that site as their top choice subsequently. And I think that really speaks to the site directors, site administrators at each site, as well as the residents. Everyone in our program is really happy at their site, uh, and hopefully you'll be able to see that later today. So I was in this program many years ago, and I didn't get my top choice. And I've been there now for like 25 years. <laughs> so. so the factors that uh, to consider when you're, when you're creating your site selection or, or your rank list, uh, there are a number of things. And where do, we, where do we get this information? We actually surveyed you or your, your, your colleagues. We wanted to know what the reasons were anonymously uh, for ranking sites number one. And we didn't want geography to be a factor, but it was. It was the most powerful factor for why people choose a site number one, um, which was a bit you know, disconcerting to us because they, we can't really move sites. <laughs> Once they're built, they kind of have to stay there. So we recognize that. And that's why when we first look at the list and we try and match you, we want to put you at your number one site because we know that geography was probably the, the most important factor there. Okay? And so 60% of you will be happy with your geography. 40% uh, may not be as happy. That's why you want to look at the other things when you're, when you're creating your rank list. So have a look at the family medicine structure. Is there a hospital-based family medicine teaching unit, which in a GTA stream, 10 out of the 12 are, or is the community office where two of the, the 12 are? So those would be North York General and the Scarborough Hospital. <coughs> So have a look at that. Do you want to work in a teaching unit? Do you want to work one-on-one -on -one with preceptors? That, that could be a factor in your, uh, in your selection. Um, another factor might be whether you want a horizontal or block format. Again, remember that the outcomes for horizontal versus block are the same. So it's not, you know, if, if you get a block program, um, you'll do as well as if you get a horizontal program. In theory, the horizontal program um, is perceived, or, or the horizontal program is perceived as providing a greater degree of continuity of care. But with the, with the advent of EMRs, that sort of leveled that playing field. Because you can have access to patients charts wherever you want. You, have them, you can access them from home, you can get all your consult notes. Whereas when we used to use paper charts, uh, the only way that you could see results and access consult notes would be to actually be physically at, uh, at the clinic. So now that's not an issue. So it, the MRs have really uh, leveled that, uh, uh, th that issue. Uh, and then the last thing is special interest. That's another, I think, a significant factor for some. Some people are interested in women's health, so there might be some sites that you might feel you know, might be more suitable. Some people want inner city health. There might be some sites. Some people want to do HIV primary care. There might be a couple of sites there. But keep in mind that no matter what site you end up, you should be able to get everything you need out of that site, except maybe for HIV primary care, where there might be two sites. But even in that scenario, as I've told uh, uh, some of you probably during the interview and information sessions, we had a resident who, for whatever reason, wanted to do HIV primary care, did not end up at one of the two sites, the so St. Mike's or St. Joe's, um, and then approached us early on to say, look, I didn't, this is what I want to do. Um, and so we ended up creating a second half day back for her at St. Mike's, where all she did was she saw patients with, with, with HIV. Um, and she developed an expertise and then was able to, to, to take those skills and practice uh, abroad, and now I think she's one of our faculty members. So, um, you know, we, we can work around these things. So if you don't get your number one choice, um, don't sweat it. Um, you know, come to us, talk to your site directors, your program assistants, talk to us. Uh, you know, we'll do whatever we can to, uh, to allow you to meet your educational needs. This is just a slide that goes over which sites are horizontal versus block. You will find all this information on our website. And the big thing to look at is the quick facts chart, because that actually goes through each different site, whether you need a car, whether there's public transit. That's probably the most useful uh, piece of information on our website to look through um, before you make your decision. Um, I'm not going to go through this. Just in interest of time, you can look this up on our website also, just the main difference. Uh, between a horizontal <laughs> curriculum, which is here, where you do basically three half days um, around uh, family medicine throughout your training without doing any solid blocks of only family medicine, um, whereas, and you do have a protected academic half day uh, in both the horizontal and block, versus the block uh, curriculum, where you usually, you still have half a day of family medicine when you're off, quote unquote, off service, uh, but when you're on 
your family medicine block in the in the second picture there, uh, you spend uh, much more of your time in family medicine. Just just one thing to to uh, point out: if you're in a block system and you're in family medicine, uh, some sites, especially after you do a month or two of, of family medicine clinics, may offer you a half day of enrichment. So you could do a bit of a longitudinal experience and say plastic surgery to do lumps and bumps or in uh, dermatology to see, you know, also, rashes day in also and day. lumps and bumps. <laughs> so, so, uh, you say, really like lumps and bumps. bumps. I really like lumps and bumps. So, uh, or, or GI, or whatever you want. So, so there's a, an opportunity there to, uh, to incorporate a bit of a longitudinal experience in terms of enrichment. All right. Okay. So we're so Dr. Igler is going to speed through these questions, and then if you have any questions, we'll go through a few now. Um, and otherwise, you are free to email us, especially if you're watching this later, um, or you can speak to the site directors when you have a chance to meet them. Um, and again, all of their information should be on the website, and you can email the site directors and the chief residents uh, at your leisure after after the session, also. Okay. So these are the common questions that, that, that we've been asked. So we're going to ask we're going to ask them of ourselves, and then I'm going to try and respond to them. So does my PGY1 or, or, or and PGY2 site location impact on PGY3 opportunities? Uh, the answer to that is no. Um, and so you're going to hear from different sites about you know if you ask them well how many of your uh, PGY2s have gone into the eMERGE program? If you ask them this year, you're going to have some sites saying yeah two of ours did, um, but that doesn't mean that last year that happened or the year before that. Um, so keep in mind that uh, um, no matter where you do your PGY1 and PGY2, it doesn't impact on where um, you, you end up as far as a, a PGY3 option, okay? So uh, because you have a, a number of electives and selectives that you could use if you really wanted to work at a particular site uh, to get to know the program director, for example, um, that you can take advantage of. So it doesn't really matter where you're at. Um, question number two, if I want ER, trauma, IC opportunities, do I have to pick a site that has those opportunities, again, the answer is no, because you can move around, right? There's flexibility here. So as long as it's logistic, logistically able to move around, so you're not traveling from one end of the city to the other, um, you know, it's, there is opportunities to, to move in terms of uh, uh, the different um, uh, rotations that you might want to do. Uh, question number three, do I need to live close to the site I... Match to. Read that, I match to. <laughs> Uh, so the answer there, you think all the answers are no, right? This one is actually a yes. Um, and the reason is that it, it doesn't have to be, but ideally you want to be close. And the reason is, is for on-call. Some of the calls you do are um, out of hospital call or home call. And so you have, generally there's some, sort of, there's some sort of a policy or guideline at the site about how far away you can be, usually about 20 minutes to half an hour. So you, if you're further away than that, then you're going to be asked to stay in, in-house. Um, so, you know, keep that in mind that, that you, you may want to choose a location uh, to live that's relatively close uh, to the site you match to. That being said, I also will say this is Toronto. It's not always possible to live close to, to where you match to because of cost, cost is an issue. Um, and so I will say that a lot of people do make it work and it's sort of a personal decision. If you do have a car or access to public transit, sometimes people find that that gives them a bit of time and separation from the site, which can actually be nice. <laughs> Uh, so sometimes people that I've spoken to who have li who have matched to say Scarborough have lived downtown and they've enjoyed that time traveling there um, as a bit of separation, listening to podcasts, catching up on sort of the rest of their life um, during that time. So it, it is really a personal preference, but just keep in mind uh, if you're the type of person and if you are on call. Um, you may have to stay in hospital if you're on home call uh, because you may it might be too far a commuting distance to go back to your actual home. Uh, if I really want a horizontal program but get a block program, what should I do? The answer there is nothing. Uh, as I said before, um, there, there's no difference in terms of outcome between horizontal and block. Um, if you, but if you want a horizontal program, you shouldn't, you shouldn't get a block program, right? Because if you put, if, if, you look at, if you look at the breakdown of horizontal versus block, it's about half and half. So if you start ranking block programs at two, three, and four, and you want a horizontal, well, that's your fault, right? <laughs> so, so keep that in mind that you, you really, this, this is, you know, we put this question in because people have asked us, but really if you 
uh, sort of follow what we've said, which is rank it the way you want it to go. You shouldn't get a, a block program if you want a horizontal, and you shouldn't get a horizontal program if you want a block. Uh, is the match a lottery? The answer is no. <laughs> there was uh, a bit of a pause. <laughs> so it's not a lottery because what we try and do is we try and match you to your geographic first choice. Uh, and then after that, we try and look at what your learning needs are and match you to that. Okay? So it's not a random assignment. Um, as an IMG, am I limited to the number of sites? So you all got an email from Dr. Rambahar uh, earlier uh, about the site uh, that you would be ranking based on your cohort assignment. Um, and the reason that is the case is because some sites want uh, their residents to start July 1st and some sites have more flexibility and would prefer to, for them to start or can have them start later on. Um, so we have to um, sort of do this, this match of sites to cohorts uh, relatively early. Uh, and so that's why you may have um, fewer number of sites to choose from uh, if you're an internationally uh, uh, trained physician. Um, and that being said, feel free to come chat with me if you have any more questions about that. Um, I've, especially the top three questions are, no, which cohort you are in will not affect your application to PGY3 and Enhanced Skills programs. We do have IMGs in cohort two who do do Enhanced Skills programs. Um, and depending on what cohort you are in, you still have the opportunity to be on committees, become chief resident, be leaders in the program. So it does not impact your, your, um, your time in the program. All right, so that's it. We are going to wrap up so that you do have time to go spend and meet uh, the various site directors, site administrators, and residents. We will also both be here. If you have any questions, we'll be out over in the stone lobby. Um, maybe what I'll do is if there are one or two questions that you have that you think the whole audience may benefit from, uh, you can ask them right now. We have, do you want to one and then two? There are, there are, Repeat the question. Sorry, so the question is, in a horizontal program, uh, do you have elective opportunities like enrichment opportunities, uh, like I described for the block program? And I think you do, because you can organize your horizontal the way, the way you want it to, to go. Uh, we showed you a couple of examples of a horizontal month. One was where you had um, internal medicine solid, right, aside from the, the four family medicine uh, half days. And another one was where you had multiple I guess, uh, clinics uh, of, diff of various subspecialties. So, you know, you can make it as complicated as you want. The simplest horizontal uh, approach is to choose one experience, but you do have an opportunity to, uh, to have a enrichment experience in horizontal. And sometimes what they in fact do at some of the, the sites is they bring in that experience. So they might bring in a gynecologist who might do IUD insertions and endometrial biopsies. And so you would be uh, rotating with your colleagues through that. Um, but yeah, absolutely. You have elective experiences as well, um, and you can you can um, you know um, organize your curriculum uh, any way you, you'd like for that. Right, and Sam. So the question is, do you need ACLS? So you will. Uh, so you have to have it by the end of PGY one. Uh, it if you have it already, uh, that's great. Uh, but if you don't, then you should be thinking about registering for it, and it will be um, through done covered through PGME. So when you get your registration package, you'll get a lot of information. So PGME is separate from Department of Family and Community Medicine. PGME is all across. It's like post-MD education is the new name. Uh, and they will send you a package with immunizations, ACLS information, information on PARO, the residency group, uh, or the sort of like the union that uh, takes care of your pay and call and duty hours. And they will give you a bit of a, a remuneration for doing it also. So, probably not. Um, so, the, I keep forgetting what was the question. Uh, so, in a horizontal program, is it more difficult to organize electives? Is that the question? Okay. 
So, so the answer is, um, is, is probably not. Because I, we've been doing this, you know, we've been delivering a horizontal curriculum for uh, over 20 years. So most of the sites are quite used to that, that type of approach. Um, the the uh, requirements that you're there for your patients is the same for block or horizontal. So each site will allow you to be away from, uh, from the practice where you don't have to come back for about a month every year. So whether it's an international elective or an elective um, in another province or another city, you can be away for up to, to one month. And the reason that, that it's limited to one month is obviously for continuity purposes. If you're going to be assigned a practice, if you're not there, you can't really run it. So uh, you do have an opportunity to be away, uh, but it is limited to a month, and it doesn't matter whether it's a horizontal or a block program. All right, last question. Any takers? No. Excellent. Okay, so welcome again. Congratulations. Uh, and we look forward to meeting you when we're over in the Stone Lobby. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>